Okay, so I'm here today with Professor Robert Gailey, who says I can call him Bob Gailey from now on. Um, we are here in week five for the post-fitting rehabilitation week of the online course for individuals with amputation. Um, we're just going to have a quick chat to Bob here about some things that might help you in this week of the course. But first, if we can start, Bob, by could you introduce yourself to everyone, just for people that might not know of you, about who you are and what you do and things like that. Well, sure. And Rachel, thank you for having me. I understand the course is going super well, um, but I am a professor at the University of Miami. I've been there over 30 years and have devoted most of my life to working with people with limb loss. And so uh, it's been quite an exciting ride over the last 30 years because we've seen just so many improvements. That's great. Thank you. And and I must thank you for giving us your books that you've made available for the course participants to view. They they had a look at them. They were able to access them from week three. And we've had lots of feedback saying that they're very useful. So thank you for making those available as well. Well, thank you for the opportunity. And it's nice to be able to get the books to other people who might not have been able to uh, access them. So thank you. Great. And so we're talking about this week in week five about all the post-fitting rehabilitation. So they, we cover first fitting and, and there's lots of resources on the post-fitting rehab and gait training this week. So I was just wondering if we could start with sort of the post-fitting rehabilitation and do you have any advice or tips for the participants out about what are the most important things that they should try and take away from this week on that kind of topic? Well, when it comes to post-fitting, you're really teaching somebody how um, they're going to have mobility in their new bodies. And um, one of the issues that early on we used to try to get this perfect gait, um, but um, what we try to focus on now is preserving the other limb and preventing further adversity. In other words, is that um, we know is that those folks that lose a limb due to diabetes are at a high risk of losing the other limb. So we want to make sure that the weight is shared between the limbs uh, on simple things like rising up out of a chair, which the average amputee, as we know from the literature, is going to do that about 50 times. So using the prostheses instead of relying on that sound limb or using an assisted device that they need to is incredibly important to reduce the risk of ulcer on the other foot. In the case of the traumatic amputee is that we know that 20% of us are going to have some type of uh, osteoarthritis in either our knee or the hip. Um, but if you're a transtibial amputee, that number jumps to 40% and transfemoral, it goes up to uh, 60 to 70%. So if we can get the person to share the load, even if it requires using an assisted device, then you're extending their life with a prosthesis, which we think is very, very important. And by assistive device, just to be clear, you mean something like a walking aid? Um... Sure. Um, a, a walking aid may be uh, for uh, somebody with a little less mobility. It could be um, a walking frame or a walker, as we refer to in the States. Or it could be uh, as simple as a cane because they might need a little bit of balance. So. Um, typically what we try to do is to set somebody up um, and teach them what is normal weight bearing. In other words, is how are you sharing that, that load? Um, and I would suggest that uh, many physios, if you get behind somebody who's using a prosthesis, even if they've been using a prosthesis for a, a fair amount of time, is that um, if you look how the load is being um, place is that you'll notice this their pelvis may be skewed to the sound side and that means that just in standing they're going to have more weight on that on the sound limb but they'll still be facing forward because the trunk is going to want to maintain that forward posture so when I take somebody and I rotate the pelvis so that there's equal weight bearing between both limbs and then I have to rotate the trunk back they all of a sudden get a greater appreciation that they're in the prostheses is that, wow, this is normal. It feels like I'm a little bit skewed or cockeyed, but that's how they're going to stay on a regular basis. That's going to lead to back pain. That's going to lead to undue stress on the opposite knee and hip. So that would, that's the first thing is starting that person off and understanding where they can share the weight between both limbs. And so... 
what sort of techniques do you use to encourage them to share the weight between both limbs? So what we'll do is we first teach them what normal posture is or normal alignment is. And that's usually eye-opening as I just described. Then the second thing is what we do is we teach them where their center of mass is. And we have this little trick where we kind of get them to visualize visualize where their balance point and their center of mass is somewhere around the, the sacrum. And so then we have them gently shift the weight from side to side between both limbs or laterally so they know how far they can displace their center of mass. For many folks, especially older folks, they don't realize is that they can get that weight way over the prosthesis. So it helps with balance. It gets them to use their muscles, but it also gets weight bearing into the prosthesis. So if they can get that sense of how far they can displace their center of mass, in standing, then when they walk, they'll be more apt to have that nice sinusoidal wave. Um, the second thing that we'll do is then, uh, it's in the books and something that uh, I stumbled on many, many years ago is what we call a stool stepping exercise, which you'll see in, in many books today, is where you get the person to tighten the hip musculature, whether they're transtibial or transfemoral amputee. Uh, if they are transtibial, then tighten their quads. Um, then get weight down into the socket, and sometimes we push through the hip so they can feel that approximation. And then the third is to feel their prosthetic foot, and that's the key. We hear now about uh, with osseous integration is that this, this idea of osseoproprioception. Well, amputees also can feel through the socket because the skin has numerous proprioceptors. So we tap on the sound limb to let them know where the calcaneus, the first med head, and the fifth med uh, head is, but then we also tap on the prosthesis. That vibration can be perceived through the socket, and so they can now feel where their heel is, where their big toe is, and where their little toe is. So now they're connected to the ground. So then when they go to step up onto the stool is that they learn which muscles to tighten, usually the gluteus, medius, and minimus, um, which, um, how much weight goes into the socket, and then also they get a sense of how they're balancing over the foot. If you can give those folks those three things, regardless of the cause of amputation, they're going to take a nice slow step, um, having better balance, walking faster, and putting less forces on the contralateral limb, which is what we want to preserve. That's amazing. I never thought you'd be able to tap on the prosthetic foot and give them feedback that way. Well, you smack it really hard and they'll feel it. If they say, ow, don't fall for it because they're not feeling a thing, but they will feel that, that, that uh, uh, pressure. So you just ask them to put a little bit of weight on their heel, on the big toe. And I will tell you, out of all the things I do with people, is that's the game changer. Because once they can feel the foot, then if I ask them to roll over the foot, they'll know where their toe is, and then they'll be able to bend the knee better. If I ask them to balance, and I know that they're leaning laterally over the foot, then I can say, put weight down to the big toe, and it'll keep that center of mass um, at midline. So instead of trying to get them to think about what muscles to contract, what have you, just look at the prosthetic foot, and you can suggest put pressure in the heel, the big toe, the little toe, and you'll be amazed how nicely they're going to be able to balance over that foot. Wow, that's amazing. Um, and so this, um, this just all sounds like perfect. Uh, uh, equal weight alignment between both limbs um, will, is obviously going to translate well into the gait training and everything. At what sort of stage post-fitting do you start this process of the equal weight bearing? Um, actually, the day they receive the prosthesis. Um, again, this is where you end up working with the prosthetist, and that, um, and we try to differentiate that complaint of discomfort that they'll have because they're putting soft tissue into a socket, and that which is true pain that needs to be adjusted with the socket. And most of the time, it's just getting that person to uh, get comfortable inside the socket. And when they start focusing on the balance. Um, point inside the pelvis, then it basically becomes um, a type of control where they're, 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 uh, it's goal-oriented 
um, type of activity rather than focusing on what's going on with the socket they're looking at balance so we start that day one and once um, so we'll start with the lateral shifting possibly forward and back shifting then we do the stool stepping exercise and then um, probably the third key is getting pelvic rotation um, because that's what I would say the majority of amputees are going to be missing is that idea of um, pelvic rotation and pelvic rotation is key to everything that they'll do from this point forward um, and it doesn't matter if they're going to use a walking frame or they're going to use crutches is that when they lift and they kick the prosthesis going forward the center mass is moving back and that's when the person is going to be most apt to fall or to be uncomfortable with balance and insecure and not wear the prosthesis. So even if they're using a walking frame, if they rotate their pelvis, they're going into the most stable base, the frame, and obviously moving forward. Um, the way that we do it is um, was first described by Cabot Voss and Knott, which is resistive gait training. Um, getting the sense is that the pelvis anterally rotates five degrees um, and is obviously described in the, in the um, books that they are now available, um, but the real essential component to that is the height of the prosthesis. If the prosthesis is shortened because the prosthesis wants to uh, decrease the risk of catching the toe and falling, they're actually putting the person at greater risk um, because you, with pelvic rotation, is that you can't rotate the pelvis if you don't have equal length of the prosthesis because it's just too short you can't roll over the toe so the person is going to naturally have to hike the hip and kick the leg forward and therefore the weight's going to go backwards at first a person will complain oh this is too tall I'm, I'm off balance then if I spend just 30 minutes teaching them how to rotate the pelvis it's how they walk the day before they lost the limb it feels natural their knee will go from just a few degrees of flexion because they're just lifting and kicking to 60 degrees of knee flexion. They'll feel much more stable and they'll forget all about the fact you heighten the prosthesis at the end. So pelvic rotation, once you get that, that you start on the balance and it does, the balance doesn't have to be perfect. Weight bearing doesn't have to be perfect. But pelvic rotation is key right off the bat. In fact, one of the interesting things that have occurred is that, that uh, Walter Reed, uh, um, military, or it used to be Army Medical Center, but it's now our National uh, Military Medical Center. But um, we started to do what we call rapid uh, amputee rehab program, where because of the use of high-tech prosthetics, and you don't have to have high-tech prosthetics, but um, the use of the, the power knee, when we put those on amputees and had them walk with the knee naturally flexed there at the right height, and just got them to walk, what we noticed is that they had normal pelvic rotation. It's just when they used a passive knee or they were trained to lift and kick the limb is that they had abnormal pelvic rotation. So the person wants to walk normally, however, is that because of um, you know, this, this, this system where we shorten the prostheses and we teach them these habits of kicking back and forth in the prostheses, they start to develop bad habits, which then translate into other gait deviations, which in turn puts more weight and stress on the opposite knee and the back. So I know that's a long way to say that it, transverse pelvic rotation is huge, but once you get it, then, and only then, because as the pelvis rotates, can you get trunk rotation because it moves in opposition so the person has better balance. If you don't get pe transverse pelvic rotation, you can't get trunk rotation, and the person will be off balance. They'll rely on the contralateral limb, and that's when you run into other problems. So I wanted to ask you next, I was going to say, um, when you see amputee patients at a later stage or individuals with amputation at a later stage in their rehab or they come to you later, I wanted to ask you what are the most common issues that you see, but I, I suspect your answer is going to be that they don't have pelvic rotation and they don't weight bear equally. Sure. Those are the same things. It really doesn't matter if the person just uh, had surgery and the loss of limb uh, a couple of weeks ago or if it was several years ago is that typically they developed a reliance on the contralateral limb. Um, through the years is that 
Um, there's been a way that the prosthesis has been shortened. And by the way, is that one of the ways to check if the pelvis is level is oftentimes the prosthetist will go ahead and check the alignment and assume that the iliac crests are at equal height um, when the person is standing. But if the person has more weight on the sound limb, is that the pelvis is going to be higher because they're not all the way down in the socket. And we know that socket displacement due to work that was done uh, recently and looking at the amount of excursion that takes place with soft tissue, um, the person will move almost 40 millimeters inside a trans uh, a femoral socket, 20 millimeters in a transtibial socket. So if they don't have full weight bearing, it'll appear that it's higher, but when you rotate them, they'll drop down into the socket, get more weight, and they're actually walking on a shorter prosthesis. So you have to get the height there, then check the height, and then you can move forward. And that, so if a person's been walking like that for a long time, you're exactly right. Those are the problems that they're going to have. Yeah. So excellent, really excellent tips. I think um, some really good things for people to think about as they're working through the resources this week. Is there anything else in particular that people should just think about that's important in this post-fitting rehab stage? Yeah, I, I, I think that and finally it's just getting that person to, to walk as much as, as they possibly can. Um, one of the things we find is that walking speed is important. So once we get the person to have better balance um, with pelvic rotation, trunk rotation, and they can have single limb balance over the limb, we then get them to roll over their toes and teach somebody is that I know that it is a bit scary to walk on a prosthesis and they'll tend to want to walk slower, but that also puts them in a state of less balance. So if we can teach the person how to walk faster and kind of just push them a little bit out of that comfort zone, they'll find that it's a lot easier, it's less energy expenditure, um, and that actually it puts less stress on the spine. And there's a, a lot of nice work that's coming out that is showing is that speed matters. And so um, if once you can get all those pieces together, you get the person to walk closer to what we look at as normal walking speed, um, a lot of these other things will go as, away as well. But th those are the key things. Easily said uh, in, in conversation or in lecture, um, but as every therapist listening knows, it takes uh, weeks if not months uh, for somebody to learn how to do all of those things. Easily said, but but easy to remember and easy to, to try and incorporate into treatment programs. So that's really useful. So Thank you so much for talking to us today, um, Bob. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. I'm sure everyone is going to really appreciate those tips, and I hope that they will be able to take them forward into their practice. Well, thank you, Rachel. And best of luck to everybody out there taking care of a very special population. Thank you.